open your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. If you're new to Manoa Community Church, we have just launched last week into a new preaching series on Hebrews chapter 11 called Faith. There are cards on the organ and all the pews. Please invite your friends to this. We're going to spend the next few months into the new year going through this one chapter of the Bible. And last year we looked at, or last year, last week we looked at the first three verses on the nature of faith. Today we enter into verse 4. Yes, just one verse. We're going to look at the life of Abel. Because this has been called the Hall of Faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we get a lot of characters from the Old Testament who make the short list, are commended to us for their faith. And Hebrews chapter 11 is all about the value of faith, how God commends us for our faith, and how it's impossible to please God without faith. So we do well as believers and as human beings created by God to understand what faith is and also to look at the short list of those characters. I shared last week, I'm excited to go through this series with you as well because it allows us to sweep through the Old Testament and put together some of the uh, highlight reel, if you will, of the various characters um, that we bump into because there's about 16 characters that we will look at, these elders of old, these great godly men and women of old. And I'm purposely not going to call them heroes because they all have faults. There's only one hero in our Bible, and his name is Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Yes. Some of these people are going to make us a little bit uncomfortable because we'll look at their lives and we'll say, there's some great things and they have some strong faith, but there's also some yuck factor. But I will say this as we go through this series, that is our point of connection with them because there's a little bit of yuck factor in your life too. Can I get an amen? Amen. The point of our continuity is also our faith and our sinfulness, and yet God has mercy on them and he has mercy on you. And they're not disqualified from the hall of faith despite their sin and neither are you. Because we saw last week in verse 3, by faith we believe that the world was created, that he wants to fold you and me into the hall of faith, beginning with creation itself, hence the cards with the galaxy and believing the unseen, the curtains pulling back with the A there. But today we're looking at very ancient history, uh, really before time was really being recorded, because Adam and Eve are in the beginning of our Bibles, and they have two children, Cain and Abel, And this starts to set up this fork in the road in the Bible of two ways to live. And Abel represents a faithful life, and Cain represents the way of depravity and the way of the evil one, just like the serpent who slithered into the world and deceived humanity. He represents one being tempted by the evil one. And Abel makes the short list at the front of the list. And so we're going to look at this one verse But we already read uh, chapter 4, so you have the backstory. We're going to weave it together and see what do we learn about Abel's faith that we are called to emulate and commend in our own lives. I've called today's sermon Faithful Worship because we see the first worship of humanity where they give up offerings to God. Now, there's no temple at this point. There's no tabernacle. There's no synagogues. I mean, this is just out in the hills, and yet right away they know that God is their maker and that they owe him an offering and gifts. And so they go to give their gifts, and things go terribly wrong. Yet Abel is faithful, and his worship is faithful. So if you're taking notes, the sermon is entitled Faithful Worship. I'll begin this by rereading not only verse 4, but verses 1 to 3 into 4 to set up the context and then pray for us. So please follow along both in your Bibles or on the screens, beginning in verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old, the elders, receive their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Verse 4. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, Though he died, he still speaks. Faithful worship. Let's pray. Well, Father God, we thank you for the hall of faith. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you have not left us groping in the dark with the way to please you. You have explicitly described what pleases you, and it is faith. It's impossible to please you, God, without it. And yet, God, in our fallen state, none of us would have it. 
And so though you require it, we also know that it is a gift that you grant by your grace. And so God, as your word is proclaimed once again, I pray that you would impart the very faith that you require because your word says that faith comes by hearing your word. And for the believers in this room, Lord, I pray that our faith would be strengthened. And for those who have no faith, we pray that it would be even granted today through the hearing of your word. Speak, Lord, for we are listening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. What is worship? When you hear the word worship, you probably first think about the Sunday service, that we're gathering to worship God. Or maybe you think about music, because in the American church, music and worship have kind of become synonymous. So we like to listen to worship songs, and we have a worship director. But Esteban would be the first one to say that worship is much broader than what we sing to God. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, I'll put it up on the screen, we're told, in light of the gospel, in light of God's mercy, Paul writes to the Roman Christians, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. All of life is worship, and worship was going on in the world before there were church buildings, before there were synagogues, before there were temples. Intuitively, humanity knew the moment that we were created, we were created to worship and glorify God. And that is pictured through the lives of Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, where they have a right impulse to begin to worship God, even though they don't fully know how to do that yet. We saw in our reading that they were already starting to bring their sacrifices and gifts to God because God is worthy of our whole life, including the first fruits off the top, our labors, what we get from the ground. Because these two characters, we are told, are a farmer. One works the ground and one is a shepherd. They didn't have currency. They didn't have cash. There was no government at this point. You're not putting your dollar bills. You're not doing an auto draft from your bank, right? And yet, they knew God is worthy of worship. Both of them come to God to worship. One of their worship is commended as faithful. The other is commended as, or shown to us as being unfaithful and rejected. Not only is one of their characters, their worship is rejected, but it actually starts to disclose what's in their heart. And horrifically, we have the first martyr and the first murderer in the first four chapters of our Bible. Humanity is not off to a good start in the beginning after creation. Our parents weren't the only sinners. Sin is now writ large into the storyline of the Bible. And so as you're taking notes this morning, there's three things. If Cain's worship is rejected by God, is it possible? Is it possible that we, in 2022, might think that we are worshiping God and yet still not be a faithful worshiper? In the hall of faith, I believe that's why this made the short list, because we're going to look at the life of Abel and say, why did God commend him and not his brother? And why might God commend our worship and not somebody else's? So taking notes, three things we learn about faithful worship from the life of Abel. First, faithful worship to God offers your best gifts. Faithful worship to God offers your best gifts. Gifts. Now I'm going to reread a portion of verse 4 and then also pull in some of Genesis chapter 4 to make this case. Because he says again, by faith, Abel offered to God, look at this underline, a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. Now please look at the screen also for Genesis chapter 4, which was already read. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Now, I'll be the first to admit, when I read Genesis chapter 4, the first thing I look at is, man, Cain, your offering's really lousy. Abel, way to hit it out of the park. My first thing when I look at it is to say, what went wrong? 
Because one's a farmer, he's bringing his produce. One is uh, agrarian, right? Or one is a, a shepherd, he's bringing his sacrifice. Why is one accepted and the other is rejected? Well, we'll talk about motives in our second point. So I'm going to withhold those comments for now. But I want to look at the nature of the actual sacrifice itself. We're told by Hebrews that one was more acceptable, implying one was unacceptable, right? Less acceptable. If you like the King James or New King James Version, one was more excellent, meaning the other one was lousy or poor. And so in Genesis chapter 4, now there are some oral traditions that surround this as well, but it does give us some clues because first, we are told that it is the firstborn that he brings from the flock and also from the fat portion. Now, we as Americans, are, we're preoccupied with thinness, aren't we? I just lost about 30 pounds the last year. Some of you are saying, where'd my pastor go? Because I'm getting thinner. Because we like to be thin, right? That's our culture. We like thin. But in the Bible, when it talks about skinny, usually that's a bad thing, right? Do you remember when the, the dreams of Pharaoh and they had the lean cows who were really skinny? And then they had the really plump cows, the years of plenty and the years of famine. Remember that? And so skinniness is usually like you're, you're given the least bit, and fat is the best part, the best portion. The fat and the marrow you read in your Bible. The, if any of you like a nice juicy steak, they're not throwing away the fat. That's the juicy part. And so in this, what is implied here is he's giving the firstborn, he's giving, and that's in our Bibles, the firstborn, the first fruits, the off the top, the very best He's giving God the best from his flock, and the other one's giving some from the fruit of the ground. Just picking up a couple apples, oranges that fell on the ground. I don't know exactly where he's picking. He throws it on the altar. God says, you gave me your best. He commends him. He says, that's more acceptable. That is beautiful. He says, seriously? The God of the universe? You're a farmer, and that's what you scrape together for me? He says, I have regard for this. I don't get the leftovers of your life. I want the first fruits. I want the firstborn. I want the best. I want the fat. I want the top. Because God deserves our best gifts and our best worship. Can I get an amen? amen. He deserves the best because God is the best. And by the way, he is the best and he gave the best for you. Because when God sent somebody to save you, he didn't send the angels. He sent the firstborn over all of creation, and he sacrificed himself for you on the cross. God gave the best for you, and out of that mercy, Romans 12, because of the mercies of God, we give our whole lives back to him as a living sacrifice. It's not coincidental that God really liked the sacrifice of atonement over the fruit offering, is it? Because writ large on our whole Bible is we are sinners and we need our sin atoned for by the blood of the Lamb. And in the very first pages of your Bible, God sees the firstborn. He sees the blood of the Lamb. He says, that is what I am looking for and that is what I will send to save the whole world. The whole world. The Passover feast is commemorated by Jews to this day because the blood of the Lamb covered their doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over them. There is a lot written into this initial sacrifice that shows why we as Christians should totally get that that's the right sacrifice, right? Well, here's the thing. Abel is held out for you and for me as a faithful worshiper, not only so that we would look at his life of worship and say, what a good dude, but so that we would look at our faith and say, what am I laying on the altar? Is God getting the leftovers of my life with my calendar? Do I look in how much time I have left over and squeeze church in once or twice a month? Versus the first day of the week, the first thing I do is I come to worship the Lord on the day that he rose from the dead. It's the first day of the week because he gets the first, he gets the best, right? Do I look at my budget? When my wife Sarah and I were married, we were $100,000 in debt when we said I do. Mostly school debt, a little bit of car debt, right? And we took Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University, which I commend to you. It teaches you how to get out of debt. He said, you're going to be tempted to stop giving to God to get out of debt. But he said, don't do it because God controls the whole world. 
And a lot of people go and they say, once, once I get to the bottom of my budget, after I pay all my bills and pay all my debts and pay all my expenses, I get to the bottom, there's nothing to give to the Lord. And Ramsey says, and I think this is right, he said, sir, that's because you got your budget upside down. First fruits off the top go to the Lord, not the leftovers. I live that way. We paid off all 100000 in less than three years. Miraculous, right? Go to his website. Lots of people. We're debt free. Never robbed God in the process. Where does God fit into your life? Now, I want to be careful. We walk by grace. All of us are mixed motives. All of us have a mixture of the flesh and the spirit. And yet this is put right into our Bible to say God looked at this and he was pleased. He looked at that and he said, no thank you. <laughs> leftovers, you can, keep, you can keep that. I don't need your leftovers. I want the best. As Christians, as God does a great work in our lives, as his mercy overflows in our lives, I want you to pray this week, where is God getting the leftovers? Where is God getting the end of it rather than the first of it in my life? He deserves the best. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? All right, the proof is in the pudding, <laughs> all right? We can say a lot of things with our lips, but our pocketbooks and our calendars don't lie, all right? Go back and do an audit on your heart. Again, and Manoah doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money, and God doesn't need your time. This is for your good, not for his. He's, he, he's got it all. He owns it all. And when we come here to worship, are you coming on fumes? Or are you coming to worship the Lord? We come to worship God and give him our best. Amen? Amen. 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 Faithful worship to God first offers your best gifts. Secondly, faithful worship to God flows from right Motives. Flows from right motives. I want to read again the verse 4 and then I'll pull in 1 John to show this. So he says, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. It was a better one. It was a good one. It was the best than Cain. Through which he was commended as righteous. Commended as righteous. Underline the word righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Faithful worship flows to God, flows from right motives. God commends him for this act of faith as righteous. Now, earlier we're told that my righteous one shall live by faith. I want to be clear that we're not made righteous by our works. We're made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the clear testimony in our whole Bible that we are justified before God's sight by faith alone. So his works flew out of his faith, this sincere faith in his heart, and produced a righteous life, not the other way around. It didn't start with righteous, therefore faith. It's faith, therefore righteous. And yet, he says, he was commended as righteous for this gift. And we get this idea that one of them is righteous, one of them is unrighteous. First John picks this up. We'll put it on the screens. He says this to us. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, chapter 3, verse 11, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. It's right to the heart of it, doesn't it? By the way, the Bible interprets the Bible. If you look at it and say, why did he do it? That is Inspired by God. Why did he do it? What were his motives? He was jealous. He was jealous of his brother. You don't need to read between the lines, by the way, in Genesis chapter 4 to see that. One of them is looking to God and saying, God, this is for you. And the other one's bringing his gift and saying, God, this is for me. Right? I'm doing this so that one's bringing his gift to God and saying, God, I am making much of you. And the other is saying, God, here we go. Make much of me. When God doesn't throw a party for him, he says, I'm going to kill him. He doesn't just say I'm going to kill him. He does kill him. He's of the evil one. Because somebody who was doing it for God would say, what's wrong with this, God? Oh, you don't want my leftovers? I'm sorry. I repent. I will bring you my first fruits. And I'll learn from the example of my brother. 
But somebody who's in religion for themselves says, this is the first religious war, right? And we've been fighting over religion ever since. One of them is based on grace. The other is based on work. One is God-centered. This is to exalt God. The other is man-centered. God exists to make much of me. And when that doesn't work, I get crazy and get angry, and I will kill the opposition to make sure I am in the right. And that's exactly what he does. Sin destroys his soul. Sin is crouching at his door, God says. Its desire is to overtake you. Sin is crazy. It's got this almost lifelike quality in our Bible. Yes, it's just the, our desires, but it's just like the serpent that slithers in. It just it starts with the thought and then it starts to creep up and try to take over your mind and take over your actions and take over your will. It is crouching at your door. It's crouching at all of our doors. What are you going to do with that sin? Are you going to repent and resist the devil and squash him? Or are you going to give yourself to the darkness just like Adam and Eve did when the serpent slithered in? Said, you want to know good and evil? Here you go. They chose good and evil. Now one of their sons is choosing the path of goodness and the other one knows evil. It's really scary to think that when the Satan said, you will surely die, that Adam and Eve's first experience of death was to see their own child kill one of their other children. Could you imagine? It's not a wild beast taking one of them down. It's not the curse of creation and an earthquake that has its way. It's literally because of their evil choices. Now their own children are at war. And really, that's writ large across our Bibles as well. Most of the wars of the Israelites are their great descendants. Like, they're all descendants of Abraham. And by the way, it's still happening today, isn't it, between the descendants of Abraham. Sin is crouching at your door, but we as Christians know that worship is not about us. We are not here for God to make much of us. We are here to make much of God. Can I get an amen? We're here to glorify the Lord. You are a creature created by God in the way of life, and the way of Abel is faithful to say, God, I must decrease so that you will increase in my life and in the world. And if the whole world forgets Stephen Bomberger, Ron Woods, and Manoa Community Church, and God is glorified and remembered, that is what I want. May my name perish. Because it never has been and it never will be about the creatures. It's always been about the creator. And I say that and I'm so thankful you say amen. But I do have a concern in the American church because I don't think this is always true of us. There was a release in 2005. A book came out called Soul Searching of Teenagers. Studying thousands of teenagers who, by the way, are now adults, right? It's about 20 years ago. Sociologist Christian Smith wrote this book, Where is the Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers? And he created a new word for American religion. He called it moralistic therapeutic deism. MTD. The basic principles of moralistic therapeutic deism is that basically God exists to make us happy. And that we don't really need God unless we're in a pinch. And really, it's all just about being a good person. Good people go to heaven. And that's about as agnostic as we got. As I heard about moralistic therapeutic deism, I thought, how much of Christianity on the radio, on the television, on our books, you go in and you can't tell if this is a book about God or just a self-help section anymore because evidently God primarily exists to make much of me. Come on. I want to glorify and study God, and this is what my Bible says. The more I behold him, the more I glorify him, the more I worship him, the more I'm transformed to be more like Jesus, and that will make me happy. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I want you to be joyful, but I think the more that we navel gaze and say, God, I'm unhappy, just come into my life and fix it, we're already starting at the wrong place because God doesn't exist for you. You exist for God. And until you figure that out, your heart will always be broken and wandering. Because there's nothing like going back to the stars. Why do you like looking at the stars at night? We just came back from a trip where we were out in the central PA or an area where there's not a lot of light. The reason you like looking out at the stars is not because they're shining a light on you. 
but because you get lost in the awe and wonder and glory of infinity. And your soul is swept up in that, and then joy comes into your heart. That's what God wants to do in our lives. Where we behold how big he is, and we feel so small, and it makes us so happy. Isn't that the most beautiful thing in the world? Don't you love getting lost in the magnificence of the grandeur? We look at the Grand Canyon, and we get lost in it, and God just spoke it into existence, and it's just a drop in the bucket in light of all of the galaxies and universes and suns in the world. Get lost in the glory of God and find your joy in him. Amen? He does not exist for you. You exist for him. That's what a faithful worshiper believes, and that's how a faithful worshiper behaves. We know, we know that Abel did it for the right reasons, and we know Cain did it for the wrong reasons. Why? He's a murderer. He's following the father of lies. The fruit of your behavior, the greatest commandment, love God, love your neighbor. If your religion, if your Christianity is not helping you love God and other people, and it's putting yourself at the center Please, please, please rethink your theology. Please put the Lord at the center of your life. Amen? Right worship, faithful worship to God. It offers your best gifts, flows from right motives, and finally still speaks after death. Faithful worship to God still speaks after death. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. He's still speaking. Abel's blood is still speaking. Did you know that? Genesis chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. The Lord said, What have you done, Cain? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you're cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Faithful worship to God still speaks after death. The end of our Bibles, in Revelation chapter 6, we have a picture of martyrs who have lost their lives for their faith in Jesus Christ. It says that they're crying out to God, how long, oh God, how long until our blood is avenged? He says, just wait a little while longer. It's coming, not yet. And Jesus, twice in the Gospels, when he's talking about the prophets who lost their lives, these innocent prophets who stood faithful for God in their witness and their proclamation, he says, these prophets have always been killed and always been martyred all the way back to innocent, righteous Abel to the present, that Abel stands in the long line of worshipers who lost their lives standing for the truth and standing for the true worship of God. And their blood is still crying out from the ground. And sadly, their blood, and righteously though, is crying out for vengeance. And there is a day. There is a day when every wrong will be righted. And where every martyr's blood will be rectified. Where the blood of Abel that still cries out from the ground. By the way, in Genesis chapter 4, it looks like the ground is complicit in this. Did you notice that? It says the ground has swallowed his blood. Just like the ground was cursed after creation with Adam and Eve, now the, the ground is getting in on the action, trying to hide the body and trying to hide the, the blood of Abel. But the ground's not getting away with it. Cain is not getting away with it. And his blood is still speaking and crying out from the dirt itself, from the earth itself for vengeance. And yet, the author of Hebrews will not leave us in a place of bad news. Because the bad news is, friend, brothers and sisters, if we were left with only our unfaithful worship, if we were left with only our bad motives, and we laid it bare before God, all of us look a lot more like Cain than we like to admit. And yet, just like that blood sacrifice was accepted for Abel, There is one who has come, 
who has spilled his blood into the earth and into the ground, and that blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Can I get an amen? And I'm going to let the author of Hebrews say this because he actually flipped to chapter 12. I'm not implying this. This is writ large in your Bible, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gatherings and to the assembly of the firstborn, there it is, who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cries out for vengeance. The blood of Christ cries out for mercy. And the very ground that sought to swallow him up in the very grave that tried to hold him down could not hold him down. The pangs of death could not hold him. Jesus marched out triumphantly from the dirt itself. And his blood forever remains speaking mercy over the justice of God so that all the true worshipers of God who have failed with their motives, who have failed bringing their best, don't have to stand on that final day and throw their leftovers and say, Apart from my, depart from my presence. No, the blood of Jesus covers us. It said, that one is forgiven. That one is forgiven. That one is forgiven. Why? Why? Not because you were innocent, but because you were forgiven. Through the blood that speaks a better word. Amen? As we close, I want to invite the band up, invite you to stand and wrap up with the story. Luke chapter 18. Go ahead, stand up. We're going to sing a song in a moment and then take communion. Jesus tells us a story about two worshipers who go to the temple to pray. There's a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now we're all queued up to think the Pharisee is able. The tax collector's king. But in Jesus' stories, there's always a reversal because tax collectors were despised. Tax collectors embezzled money. Tax collectors were sinners. The Pharisees were religious. The Pharisees knew how to make their offerings. The Pharisees knew how to bring their sacrifices. The Pharisee walked up to the temple and he prayed with his hands in the air and out loud so we all could hear him. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you that I tithe. I thank you that I give away my money. I thank you that I'm righteous and just. I thank you that I follow your law. God, thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. In the story, Jesus then turns our eyes to the tax collector and his worship. And the tax collector can't even look up to heaven. He's so ashamed of his sin. And so he beats his chest, beats his breasts. The only prayer he could spit out of his mouth, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. That one, the tax collector, he went home justified. He went home righteous. That is the kind of faith that God commends you hear nothing else, do not walk away from this sermon hearing, if I just become like the Pharisee, I'm good. It's the last thing God wants from you. He wants to know that you're a penitent, repentant, grieved by your sin. Abel knew he needed a sacrifice to atone for his sin. Do you. Don't leave this place uncertain of your forgiveness in Christ Jesus.